Amen. All right, there in 1 Peter chapter 2, look at verse number 1. He starts out saying, Wherefore, laying aside. Now, whenever you see wherefore, that means there's a, there's a reason. He's pointing back to something. So let's look at the last two verses in chapter 1 where he says, For all flesh is as grass, and the glory of man is as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. So when he starts out saying, wherefore, what reason is he talking about? Hey, number one, your flesh is as grass, right? Your body's going to pass away. But he says that the preaching of the gospel saves forever. It's everlasting life. It lasts forever and ever and ever. And once you have it, there's nothing you can do to mess that up. There's nothing you can do to lose that. And because of the reason of the fact that we have been commanded to preach the gospel, he's making it clear, hey, don't be in the flesh. We need to be in the spirit. There's sort of a theme in this chapter. Go back to verse number 1, 2 Peter 2, verse 1. He says, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings. Did you hear that? All evil speakings. We shouldn't speak against people. Listen to what he's saying. Look, as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby, laying aside... Okay, so what he's saying is, we as Christians, now that you're saved, keeping in mind this book is written to save people. This is not telling you how to become saved. It's saying now that you are saved, here's what you ought to do. Here's how you ought to live so that you'll please the Lord and be rewarded. Now, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Speaking of reward, many of you already know this chapter, the reference here. So this gospel has been given to us. Now we need to put aside all the things that are holding us back. Now we need to lay aside all the things, all these old habits. And he's saying, as newborn babes, he's saying it's like you need to go back and hit the reset button. You know, I think we all come to a point in our life sometimes in different aspects. And here's a spiritual application. Hey, spiritually, hit the reset button. Let's start over. Let's start afresh. Let's pretend like you're just born and now let's start building upon. And you know, there are many Christians that have been saved for a long time, but they didn't build on that foundation the right way. They have bad doctrine. And sometimes they have to hear what's wrong and understand what's right. And they say, okay, you know what? I'm going to throw all this out and I'm going to start from scratch. I know salvation is by faith alone. I know that Jesus is God. And start rebuilding and rebuild these foundations. He's telling them, as newborn babes, desire the sincere, sincere milk of the Word. And there's an application. Even if you've been saved for 30 years, you need to, like a baby has to have milk, that should be your desire for the Word of God. Right? You count it, you need it more than your daily bread, right? You have to have it to live spiritually. You're in... 1 Corinthians, no, in, in verse 3 there, in 1 Peter, keep a finger in, in both. In 1 Peter 2, 3, it says, If so be, ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. When he's saying, like, as a newborn babe, desire the word, understand the Lord has been gracious to you. You understand that when somebody gets saved, God really shows his grace unto them. Yeah. Right? He is long suffering. He doesn't necessarily, he doesn't always correct them as fast as he would maybe a more experienced believer, because he wants them to grow. Maybe sometimes they're still in sin and they haven't seen it in the Word yet. And when they see it, it's time to grow. It's time to say, well, hey, I see what it says. Am I going to believe it? Am I going to receive it? Am I going to obey it? And so newborn babes sort of, I think they get a little more grace from God. They get a little more mercy because God wants them to grow. Imagine if God just rain, you know, just, just kept pouring it on you. You know, where, where is this coming from? I don't even understand yet. It wouldn't make sense until you understand His law more. So He is very patient, long-suffering with new believers. Now, in 1 Corinthians 3, look what He says here. Notice He says in verse 1, And I, brethren, right, that's the saved, could not speak unto you as spiritual, but as unto carnal, that's fleshly, even as unto babes in Christ. He's talking to some people in the church, and he's saying, you're my brother, you're saved, but you're acting in the flesh. You're acting like you're in the world. I can't talk to you about spiritual things because you're still worried about the fleshly things. right? You're still hung up on the cares of the world, all these distractions that are keeping you away. He says he's talking to you like you're a babe in Christ. And a babe in Christ is somebody that just gets saved. 
These are people that are already in the church that should have doctrine, but we know in, in Corinthians they had a lot of problems. They did not obey the word. They were, they're, they're disobedient to some of God's laws. Look at verse number two. I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet are ye able. Neither yet now are ye able. He's saying you can't handle the meat. You can't handle the deeper things of God. You should have already been able to choose some meat. And could you imagine if your 12 year old was still on milk and refused to chew meat, refused to grow up, and they wanted to walk around with a pacifier and be disobedient and refuse to grow. And sometimes we have Christians in the church that are like this. Yeah. They know what's right. They know what they need to be doing. And instead they say, well, it's all under grace. Yeah, hey, there's more grace for the new newborn, right? We're, we're very merciful with the child when they're disobedient. My child stole somebody's umbrella earlier, right? It, it wasn't worthy of punishment. She stole, although stealing is, she needs to understand that first before she gets punished. Right. And God's the same way with us, right? He's very merciful. He's long-suffering. He's patient. But there comes a time to grow. And for those that dig in their heels and refuse to grow, God doesn't reward them on the earth or in heaven for that. He punishes them. Yeah. Look what he says in verse 3. 1 Corinthians 3.3, 3, he says, For ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? This is exactly what he was talking about in Peter, that we need to put away these things. He says, here your church, you have all these things. Envyings and strife. Turn to Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5. And Christians that don't grow... Through the Word, they become weak. They become weak, pathetic Christians in all reality. I mean, they're just, they're sorry in God's eyes. I bet there's a lot of people that God looks down at and He's like, you're mine, but you're acting, acting like a baby. Right. You're acting like a little baby. Why don't you grow up and obey me and do something for me? Sure. But many Christians, they're just hard head, just a hard head, a hard heart. And spiritually, they become weak. And when you look at them, He says, you're yet carnal. Right? He's saying you're fleshly. You look just like the world, even though you're saved. And that's a shame. Without, that ought not to be said of Christians. They're walking as unsaved men, not as saved saints. And God, will, of course, will chastise them to get their attention. That's right. They may think, well, I've got some blessings, and life is good, and life is convenient, but God will punish you to get your attention yeah. so that you'll wake up and obey Him and get in the fight for Him. In Hebrews chapter 5, look at verse number 11. It says, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered. That means difficult to say. Listen, and hard to be uttered. Seeing ye are dull of hearing. You know, if you talk to somebody and they refuse to understand, like imagine again, imagine the 12 year old that, that eats like a baby. What if their language level was the same as a baby? And they refuse to compose sentences and full words and they, they communicate with grunts. This 12-year-old, it would be hard to say something to them. It would be difficult to communicate to them what they need to do, how they need to go. They just, it's like they're stopping their ears and refusing to hear what God says. Right. You can't close your ears. It hurts other people. It makes it difficult. He's saying it was hard for him to utter to them. He says, yeah. ye are dull of hearing. Look at verse 12. For when the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. Again, here he's saying, you can't handle the deeper things. You don't know the doctrines like you ought to. You're weak. In all reality, you think about it, just, just about any profession, once you have somebody on the job for about six months, they begin to become skilled, right? Once they've been there for a year, and then two and three years, they come to the point where they're able to teach others also. Yeah. Right? If you have a guy on the job for three years and he can't teach the basics, the very principles of your job to somebody else, you have a problem. Yeah. Right. It's a heart problem. They're lazy. They don't respect authority. And this is exactly what God's talking about. That's we're, we're His servants, right? And yeah. if you've been a Christian for three years and you don't know why we should get baptized... Right? Or you don't know the Scriptures that prove that it's by faith alone. Well, then guess what? You, God might look down and say, you're a baby. Yeah. You can't handle the meat. You can't handle the deeper things that you're supposed to be teaching others. Sure. And like I said, God will chastise to get your attention. Look at verse 13. Hebrews 5.13 For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is 
a babe. Hey, have more than the proverb of the day. If that's all you've got, if that's all you can share with somebody as a proverb of the day, if that's all you can do is just re-like something on Facebook and say, oh, I shared a verse. I mean, that's milk. Yeah. But can you open your mouth and boldly tell somebody else what God has said? Can you explain and defend the doctrines of the Bible? Right. If not, it's time to grow. Yeah, it is. It's time to grow up. It is. Look at verse 14. He says, But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use, he's saying by those that have used it, have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Go back to 1 Peter chapter 2. So he's saying the strong meat, the doctrines of God, only the only person that can handle that and use it is somebody that has used it. Somebody that has dug in, they've studied, they searched it out, they've got their verses. And a lot of times this happens. That's why I love soul winning. I love the fact that we are a soul winning church because you knock on somebody's door and they start talking about John Calvin and his words being on par with the Bible. And if you don't have an answer that day, a good soul winner is going to go home and say, I'm going to get to the bottom of this. Amen. Right? I want to know what's wrong with John Calvin yeah. and what he said because they seem to contradict the basics of the gospel. And as a good soul winner, you ought to be prepared. You ought to arm yourself to be able to handle the meat. To be able to be ready to, to you know, grow up, eat some meat. God wants you to. He can use you more when you study these things out. In 1 Peter chapter 2 where you're at, let's look at verse number 4. Of Jesus here is talking. It says, To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Right? Disallowed means not allowed or rejected. It says, Ye also, as living stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. So here he's saying, He's a, a living stone, you also are a lively stone, right? We will be like Him, right? Once, once we're saved, spiritually we're like Him. Hey, once we're resurrected, physically we'll be like Him. There's things to come. In 1 John 3, He says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him. For we shall see Him as He is. So when the Lord returns in the same way that He left, right visible every eye seeing him when the lord returns and we all see him we too will be as he is we will we will be manifest in our spiritual body so when he says to offer up spiritual sacrifices here well what are spiritual sacrifices because there's a lot of groups out there that would say that they're doing spiritual sacrifices to god but it's it's not what the bible would define in romans 12 he says i beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of god listen that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. You want God's blessing on your life? Just do the reasonable service. right? Just do the basics, which he says, I want your body, it belongs to me. Yeah. There are things in this world that go against what God wants for your body, and if you partake in those things, guess what? You're defiling the temple, and God may destroy that temple. Yeah. Why should God reward you? Why would God want to use you in a mighty way if you're rejecting His law, if you're defiling your own body? You think about it. In Hebrews 13, he says, By Him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to His name. So what is a spiritual sacrifice? It's to live holy, right? And it's to give thanks. To give thanks where it's due. To thank God for the very breath that you have. Your family, your life, the food, everything. He deserves credit. And when you get puffed up, oh, I got this and I earned this. And I, hey, whoa, 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 whoa. Give some credit where it's due. Yeah. But listen, a sacrifice, it is a real sacrifice to live holy. This is something that takes time. This is something that takes years to work at. And you'll still never be perfect. Even the Apostle Paul made that clear. Hey, he was saved and yet he would fall. He was saved and he would fall. And every Christian has this problem, but it's, it's a heart issue and a decision you have to make every day. Will I live for him and sacrifice my own will to the will of God? Look at verse number 6. Wherefore also it is contained in the Scriptures, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. This is quoting Isaiah 28 where he says, Thus saith the Lord, 
the Lord God, behold, I lay in Zion a foundation of stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. This, of course, again, it's talking about how they rejected God, but He is the foundation of our faith. Hey, this is the foundation of all salvation through all time. And yet, He also calls this stone a stumbling stone. This is something that people have a problem with. Look what He says in verse 7. Unto you, therefore, which believe, He is precious. Right? So, if you see the value in salvation, then Jesus is like a precious stone. He is the most valuable thing you could ever own is your own salvation. But if not, what does He say? But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. He's saying, if you're disobedient, you disallowed it, you didn't want it, you rejected it. Oh, we're not building, I'm not building my foundation with this stone, right? If you're rebellious, you don't see the value in Jesus. You don't see the value in the gospel. Verse 8, in a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. Now I wanna, I wanna really define this for you so you can see it and understand it. Turn to Romans 14, keeping your finger here. Romans chapter 14. To stumble means to offend, right? So sometimes Jesus would say, if you, if you offend these little ones, He's saying if you cause them to stumble. And I'm gonna show you a couple great verses to define this. But he talks about those that disobey, right? They're disobeying the gospel. We're commanded to obey the gospel, which means believe. That is a commandment. If you reject that, that's probably the most important commandment of God that you right. break. You're in Romans 14. Look at verse number 13. It says, Let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. You think about this. This is saying there is something you could do to cause your brother to stumble or to fall. Don't do that. That's what you need to judge. You need to judge yourself and say, I don't want to cause my brother to fall, to get out of church, to get out of the way. Look at verse 21 in the same chapter. It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth or is offended or is made weak. So if I do something that causes you to be weak in the faith, that is a sin. I need to judge myself on that. I need to not do that. Turn to Romans chapter 9. In Isaiah 8, he says, And he shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling, and for a rock of offense. This is talking about Jesus. Stumbling and offense. To both the houses of Israel, for a gin and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So he starts out saying that Jesus is like a sanctuary, right? He is safety to those that trust in Him, but He is a snare to the unbelievers. The next verse in Isaiah 8, he says, And many among them, let's talk about Israel and Judah, he says, And many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken, and be snared, and be taken. So he's warning that when Jesus came on the scene, Israel was going to reject Him. And they're going to fall. Ultimately, spiritually, it was their destruction because they rejected the Messiah. Now you're in Romans 9. Look at verse 31. It says, But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore, because they sought it not by faith. He's saying the Israelites didn't believe on Jesus, therefore they were offended. What, this guy is my God? I don't think so. This guy is going to save me from my sins. I don't believe it. I'll do my own way. I'm going to work my way to heaven. Look, he says, because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone. As it is written, behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone, and a rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Turn back to 1 Peter 2. Hey, when you stand before God, you're not going to be ashamed if you put your trust on Jesus. And everybody that says, hey, I'm going to work my way, I'll find my own way. What, Jesus is God? No, He's just the Son. He's not God. Whoa, you're stumbling at Jesus, and it could, it could cost you your soul if you don't change your mind. Now, I find it interesting also that 
he uses the phrase that they stumble at the word. You see that in verse 8? They stumble at the word. Sometimes when we go out preaching and we say things, people are going to get hung up on it. Whoa, come on. You really believe that? Whoa, wait a minute. But, but here's a, who is the word? Jesus. Jesus. Think about this. He says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The word is God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Again, that's Jesus saying he's God. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one. People that don't believe the Trinity, they're unbelievers. They're stumbling at that stone. I can't believe that there's three in one. I can't believe that Jesus is God. Hey, you will stumble. You will fall. You will be broken. And that's not where you want to be. That's why you preach the Gospel. Look at verse uh, 9. So it's back to us, our responsibility. He says, But ye are a chosen generation a royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of Him who hath called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. The call is, come out of the world. The call is, now that you're saved, quit living like the world. Get out of your sin and come work for God. Turn to Exodus 19. We're going to look at where this originated. But we as Baptists, we believe in the priesthood of the believer. Right? He says here that we are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a chosen generation, right? A peculiar people. That doesn't mean we're a group of weirdos. That means we're weird to the world. They look at us and they say, what well, you guys, is, that's foolishness what you guys are doing. On a Wednesday night after work, you come here to listen to the Bible? That's foolishness in their eyes. Right? But God says that we are priests. Now in the Old Testament, the priest, God had a purpose. This person was there to judge and to give the law. Right? Well, in the same way, God says that we are are priests. So you, through the power of the Holy Spirit, can judge all things. He will teach you all things. He will lead you and guide you into truth. This is salvation. This is part of it. And that's where all the other religions will reject that phrase, the priesthood of the believer. Yeah. In Revelation 1, he says he hath made us kings and priests. That's pretty straightforward, yeah, isn't it, right? Yeah. In Revelation 5, he says, and hath made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Blessed, for Revelation 20, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign a thousand years. So guess what? When we're resurrected, when the Lord rules the earth for over a thousand years, we will be kings and priests with Him there. And now, spiritually speaking, you are a king, you are a priest. And it's time to act like it. It's time to wake up and quit being a baby and just saying, well, I'm comfortable with church. I'm comfortable with life. It's time for you to get real serious about it and say, well, look, I've been saved for so many years. Yeah. I should be a teacher. I should understand and be able to explain this doctrine, but I'm not. Uh -oh. Here the, the Word confronts you and says, hey, you were called out. You were supposed to be a holy nation. And just as God rejected Israel because they refused to obey, do you want to find yourself in that same situation? Right. No. You're in Exodus 19, find verse number 5. Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all the people, for all the earth is mine. Notice God uses the if and then. Yeah. Right? How come the rest of the so-called independent Baptists can't seem to figure out those two words? Yeah. Right? Oh no, the Jews, they're always God's people. No, even when He made this statement, they were not. Right. He told them, if you do it, then... You'll right. be my people. Yeah, that's right. And today, in the same way, if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, then thou shalt be saved, right? Yep. But now that you're saved, if you will obey His Word, then He will bless you. Right. And uh, Would you rather sin unto death? Would you rather God destroy your temple because of your rebellion? Or would you rather obey God? Look what he says in verse 6. He says, And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. Hmm. That is us today. Go back to 1 Peter yeah, 2. We are a kingdom of priests. We have a spiritual kingdom we're in right now. And we are all priests. If you're saved, you have the ability to teach the law and help people understand God's Word. You ought to be teachers. Find verse number 10 in 1 Peter 2. Which in time past were not a people, listen, but are now the people of God. What kind of people? Priests. Kings, rulers, right? A holy nation. He says, But are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, 
but now have obtained mercy. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. If there's one phrase you could remember for the whole night, I want you to remember this. I want you to repeat it in your mind. Abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. He says that you're a pilgrim. He says that you're passing through, right? We are sojourners. My spirit does not belong in this earth forever. My soul and my spirit are different, right? This flesh, this body is temporary. Turn to Romans chapter 7. Now that you're saved, you need to fight for spiritual growth. You need to learn the Word of God. You need to preach the Gospel. And if you're walking in the flesh, that's a daily choice that you've made. When you're presented with lust, when you're presented with sin, when you're presented with pride, and you, and you just kind of shrug it off, I'm under grace, it's okay, I, you know, I'm a big boy, then God's like, why should I bless that? Why should I continue to bless you spiritually when you're walking in the flesh? These fleshly lusts, it says they war against your very soul. We're, we're, we're torn between two. And, and we're told in the Bible that we should die daily. Can you imagine waking up in your spiritual man, your inward man, holding a gun to that fleshly man? Saying, go ahead. Oh, I wish you would. I'll drop you right now. You know what I'm saying? That's the attitude we ought to have. We need to just kind of wake up and say, well, there's that, there's that temptation again. All right, I'll get... No! Stop! Fight against it. Stand up against it. Be a man that wars against your soul. The Bible says we should pick up our cross, right? Daily and follow Him. Can you imagine? I mean, okay, let's put the flesh to death again. Hey, His mercies are new every morning. If you messed up today, that's alright. You have tomorrow morning. That's, pick up your cross. Die to the flesh. Make the threats if you have to. Body, you better stop. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> right? But understand the power of your spirit and the power of God's Holy Spirit to help you overcome these things. And he says that the fleshly lusts war against your soul. Amen. You're in Romans chapter 7. Look at verse number 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal. Again, fleshly. He says, sold under sin. For that which I do, he's talking about sin, right? That which I do, I allow not. For what I would, right? When I would do the right thing, he's saying, that do I not. But what I hate, again, sin, what I hate, the sin that I hate, that do I now, why did he say that the law is spiritual, but I'm carnal? He's saying the things that I know that are right, I don't always do them. The things that I know that are sin, that I don't allow. Right? You set up laws, hey, I don't allow this, we don't do this. And then you find yourself doing that very same thing. That's what Paul's saying. In his own body, in his own house, he had laws, he had rules. Oh, we don't allow this in here. And then he goes and does it. And what he says is, I'm carnal, I'm fleshly, and it proves that the law is spiritual. It proves it takes a spiritual man to obey it. Look, it says in verse... Go, to, go ahead to verse 22. Romans 7, 22. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. Hey, my spiritual man agrees. That law is good. This is righteous. That's what I need. Verse 23. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind. His members, his body, his flesh is at war with the law that he understands of God. The law in his soul, in his spirit, the spiritual law is going to... There's a war in his flesh between your soul and your flesh, your spirit and your flesh. And we have to wake up every day and fight this. Paul, The Apostle Paul, one of the greatest Christians to ever live, is telling you, I do the stuff that I say not to do, and I don't do the things that I know I should do, right? Well, let's get up and go soul winning. Well, let's just sleep in, you know? Well, I shouldn't have... I shouldn't give in to that temptation... Well, we'll just do it this one time. So we're not alone. But Paul teaches us here that we have power over it through God's Word and through the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Look, he says, he says, warring against the law of my mind, verse 23 says, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Your body, it, it's guilty under the law of sin. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? You know, our body will stay in sin for the rest of our life on this earth. But our spirit is washed in the blood and our spirit can overcome the flesh. But it all goes back to your choice. Right? You chose to be saved. 
or reject the gospel, now you have to choose to obey or reject God's law. If you choose to wake up and walk in the Spirit, God will bless you and bless you and make you stronger in the Spirit. Then you're not stuck on milk. Then you can eat that steak. Then you can eat the meat. Yeah. Go back to 1 Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2, we're in verse 12. Look, he says, "...having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation." So he's saying, as you're out in the world, you need to do good works so when the world sees you as a Christian, they'll glorify God. Right? Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. You know, if you're a Christian, you have a ministry. We talked about this last week, right? Are you a Christian? Then you have a ministry of recon reconciliation Amen. to reconcile the lost world to Jesus through the Gospel, Amen. through soul winning. Yeah. In 2 Corinthians 4, he says, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, listen, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. Right? When he says here in verse 12, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, we renounce the hidden things of dishonesty. Somebody says, hey, look, we got a whole box of these parts. It worked. You want to take some? I'll take some. No, that's wicked. No, I won't have any part of it. I'm not going to steal. Yeah, but nobody will know. The boss saying, look, I don't care. God's looking. I don't want God's judgment on, on my life over something I could afford and I probably don't need. Most people steal from work on stuff that's stupid. Stuff they don't even need. He says, we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the Word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. He's saying, you just kind of give it over to God. It's like, as, as far as you are when you see me, it ought to be the same as, well, God, I leave it up to you, right? I'm going to walk honestly like I'm walking before God when I walk before the world. The world should be able to look at me and say, well, you're, you're honest, you try to do the right thing. You're trying to trying to be a nice person. Whatever you fill in the blank. And listen, that doesn't mean we let the world run over us. But what he's saying is, we should not be known as dishonest. We should be known as faithful people. We should be known as the sons of God. We have power. Do we use it? Now look at First Peter two verse thirteen here. This is kind of interesting. It kind of shifts gears. First Peter two thirteen. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake whether it be the king as supreme right for the lord's sake notice he says it sounds a lot like romans 1 where he says let every soul be subject unto the higher powers for there is no power but of god the powers that be are ordained of god he's saying submit yourselves sometimes we have what seems like tyrannical rulers and we just need to trust god and do what's right look he says in verse 14 or unto governors as unto them that are sent by Him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of them that do well. Listen, again, just like in Romans when he says in verse, he says, For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have the praise of the same. He says, For he is the minister of God unto thee for good, but if thou do which is evil, be afraid. Hey, the lawbreakers should be afraid of the law. Yeah. He's telling us as Christians we need to obey the law for God's sake. He says, For he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. When he says punishment of evildoers here in verse 14, he's talking about obeying the laws of the land for God's sake. Let it be known. Hey, there are certain laws. If you do wrong, if you steal, right? If you, if you murder, those laws are to protect the innocent. All of God's laws were to protect the innocent. Some of man's laws are to protect the innocent. We should stand up for those. We should abide by those. But you know, there are laws that go against God. Yeah. That would not protect the innocent. That would actually hurt the innocent. They would do evil to the innocent. And you know, Jesus talked about this in, in Luke 17. He talked about the, the child offenders are worthy of death. Right? They should hang themselves, he yeah, said. Yeah. Right? Yeah, they and there are certain laws that we should stand against. If the, if the world ever says, hey, pedophilia is acceptable, then we should stand against that. Right? Yeah, that's right? You know in Jacksonville, Florida, they have a bathroom law. 
You know what I'm talking about? Oh, it's part of your human right that you have to let a pedophile go in the bathroom with your child. Now listen, that is a law that I will refuse to obey. That's right. That is a law that goes against the Word of God. As Christians, we obey God rather than man. Amen. We stand up against that law. Yeah. And it's wicked that Jacksonville has become so perverse that they say it's acceptable to let a pedophile into the bathroom with your child. If you see it happen, you should stand against it. You should fight for it. Like I said, in Luke 17, Jesus warned about that. Hey, and we should stand against the city's law. We, I'm not going to obey. I'm not going to abide. If there's a place that openly announces, hey, this is what we're going to do, you should avoid that place. Hey, somebody should run for, govern, for the government seat and get these crooked perverts out of office. Because when they go against God's law, they become the evildoer. They're opening the door to protect a pedophile in the bathroom. And it's happened in many other states. It's happened in Texas. It's happened in Atlanta. It's happened in so many states where they say, we're going to let all the pedophiles come in the bathroom. And then somebody gets abused. Somebody gets hurt. Somebody gets raped. And Jacksonville says, oh, tolerance. We should let the pedophiles come in the bathrooms with the children. It's wicked as hell. It's disgusting. And listen, that is a law we should stand against. That is a law that goes against what God says that praises the evildoers. Those evildoers should be afraid. You say, well, well, you're talking about running for office and standing against laws. Are you getting political? Well, look, who, who was the greatest man born unto women? John the Baptist. How did John the Baptist die? He told a politician what he was doing was evil. He told a politician that he was living in wickedness and the guy ended up cutting his head off for it. And as Christians, we ought not be ashamed of standing up against laws that are unrighteous. Hey, in the flip side of the coin, if it's a righteous law, abide by it. Yes. Then you won't have fear of judgment coming upon you, right? If you're not murdering, you don't have to worry about the cops getting you. If you're not stealing, you don't have to worry about it. Just do what's right and trust the Lord to work it out. If the laws are right, we obey them. If the laws are evil, we refuse them. We stand That's against right. them. That's godly. Look at verse 15. For so is the will of God, that with well-doing ye put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Right? So by obeying God, doing His will, those people that attack us just for being Christians, you can put them to silence. Yeah, but I'm upstanding. I don't steal. I don't have all these problems that you have. I don't curse people for no reason. I'm going to obey God. Right? In Romans 13, he says, Whosoever therefore resisteth the power... Resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. We shouldn't fight for like marijuana legalization. Right? That's drunkenness. That goes against God's law. But we should stand up if hey they're gonna pass a law and make homeschooling illegal. Well the Bible says I'm supposed to train up my children. I'll stand against that law. Right. Through the word of God we determine what is righteous and what is not, what is good and what is evil. We stand for the good and we stand against the evil. Look at verse 16. It says, as free and not using your liberty as a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. He's saying, hey, you're free. You're, you're, you will never lose your salvation, but that, should we continue in sin? God forbid, right? It's freedom from sinning is the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not the freedom to sin and do whatever you want. And many Christians get it backwards, but there are many fake Christians out there that sort of advertise it wrong just to draw people in. Hey, come be a Christian. You can get away with whatever you want. Oh, really? This is like buying indulgences. Right? And that's what, that's what a lot of these churches have become. Look at verse 17. Honor all men. Love the brotherhood. I'm going to say that one again. Love the brotherhood. Yeah. God's commanding us to love each other. That's right. Even when it's difficult. Even when they're hard-headed people. Even when they're, they really are peculiar. When they are strange. Hey, you're saved? Cool. we got something in common. we got something in common that matters. Not a football team, not I like this brand, you like that brand, I'm a nerd, you're a what you know, hey, we're Christians. Yeah. We're brothers. We're gonna spend eternity with each other. Yeah. He says, Fear God, honor the king. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward. Right? To the froward, somebody that can be a jerk. Sometimes you just say, Okay, whatever. You know, you obey. And I, I had this situation this week, a supervisor like, I can't believe you're doing that. I can't believe you said that. You're so wrong. You're so ignorant. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. He Once he understood the situation, then he was totally in the wrong. Man, I could have blasted him. I humbled myself. That's not what a Christian ought to do. Yeah, I got you. I one-upped you. I was right. You were wrong. I let it go. Just because he knows I'm a Christian. 
He knows what I stand for. And he ought not to have a grudge against me because I one-upped him. I outsmarted him. I ought to humble myself and submit myself because I work for God, not for him. He's not my boss. I have an eternal boss, right? Amen. Look, he says in Ephesians 6, Servants, be obedient unto them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in singleness of your heart as unto Christ. Not with eye service as men pleasers. Not just doing good when they're looking. Not just, oh yeah, not just being a yes man when they're around. But you're serving Christ is his point. He says, but as the servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. With good will doing service as unto the Lord, not unto men. When you're having a bad day at work and you want to fight the system or fight the boss, just remember this. God may be using it as an opportunity for you to be a witness in a difficult time to suffer because no matter what suffering you go through, it's not what Jesus went through. I mean, he went through some suffering, all right? We have a little bit, and we feel justified in telling the world. Justified in getting on Facebook and just tell everybody, I'm going to set it straight. I'm going to let everybody... No, let it slide. Let it slide. God's the righteous judge. Commit your soul unto him. Let him deal with it. Let him reward you. And if you obey your boss now on things where you, should, where you don't really have to, where you could get away from it, I think it's easier to obey God's laws when you're confronted with it. When God shows you something you really do need to change, if you've been obeying your boss on the little things, you're like, well, that's a big thing. It's going to be hard, but it's just one more step of obedience. I've been taking a lot of those. You know, I think that's the reason that God teaches us this. Look at verse 19. He says, For this is thankworthy. Thankworthy of God. That's a good thing. He says, If a man for conscience toward God endure grief suffering wrongfully for what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your faults ye shall take it patiently but if when ye do well and suffer for it ye take it patiently this is acceptable with god hey this is rewardable by god he's saying it's no big deal when you get caught wrong and you get punished you get reamed by the boss and you just take it yeah he got me that's nothing but when you're right and you're justified and speaking back and you, and you just take it Okay. God, I'm working for you anyway. This guy don't matter. Right. Help me to do the right thing. That's rewardable by God. It's thankworthy. It's acceptable. Verse 21. He says, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow in His footsteps. Who did no sin? Neither was guile found in His mouth. Who, when He was reviled, reviled not again right he's saying he didn't return fire and and as spouses we need to remember this sometimes you know instead of one-upping your husband or wife or firing back you revile me i'll get you back oh yeah what about this what about the hey whoa stop be a peacemaker don't revile back even when you feel justified sometimes look what he says when he was reviled he reviled not again when he suffered he threatened not but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Imagine, you know when they put the bag over Jesus' head? Now, if you're God, who hit you? Which one? Who was it? Jesus could have said, you get me out of this bag, I'll kill you, right? Oh, I'll call some angels down on you. No, what'd He do? He took it. He committed Himself unto Him who judgeth righteously. He said, hey, I want you to be saved. You may not be. You might be too late for you, but I, that's not my business. That's God. You know, the Father's going to deal with you one day, and right now I'm just going to suffer. And I'll commit myself unto God. And let God reward me in His time. Like I said, when, when we're insulted, we don't need to always return fire. That is a human instinct. That is pride. And we need to fight against that. We need to stand against it. Look at verse 24. Who His own self bear our sins in His own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you're healed. We're healed from the punishment of sin by His sacrifice, not by our own. It says that He did no sin. He bare our sins in His own body on the tree, on the cross. The Bible says that we deserve death and hell, the second death. And it says that if we believe on Him, we're passed from death unto life. The Bible's clear that my sins were put on Him. His righteousness was taken off and put on me. Yep. Now my soul, my spirit, they're preserved blameless unto the day of redemption. Yep. But, 
Look what he says here. He says that we should live unto righteousness. This is an option. Right? We're being commanded. But he doesn't say, notice he doesn't say, you will automatically live right. righteously. Right. Understand, this is very important. There are people that twist this concept all throughout the Bible. This whole chapter has been clear. You're saved by faith. Now you should live unto righteousness. That's what it says here in verse 24. Yeah. But that's your choice. That being dead to sins, you should live unto righteousness. This is not a guarantee. This does not override your free will. This does not mean you're automatically going to be have, have sinless perfection as a lot of false prophets teach. And look, we read in this chapter to abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul. We read in Romans 7, warring against the law of, of our mind. It's our choice to obey God's law. It's our choices. You know, what's interesting. I got a phone call yesterday. And this guy, his name was uh, Jeff Jones. He's an evangelist, a traveling evangelist. It sounded like a, a traveling circus or traveling. <laughs> like this guy, when, I thought it was a prank when he called, right? Our church has been receiving a lot of nasty phone calls. And I really thought this guy was a put on. I thought he was using a fake accent. He said he was from Michigan, but he talked like I couldn't tell it was Arkansas or Alabama or whatever. I don't know. But the guy kept going on about, about how he wanted to come to our church and try to be a blessing to us. He said he wanted to have a meeting at our church. And I didn't understand what he was talking about. So I looked this guy up and I called him back. And he kept saying, if God would just lay it on your heart, I'll come down there and we'll have a meeting. Okay, we meet with God every week, three times a week. Come on down right. and join us. You know, I, didn't know, I wasn't sure what he was getting at. But I looked him up and he uses the word meeting sort of in lieu of revival. Okay, this guy made the claim. He, there's a church over here on the beach. He says uh, Bible Baptist Church on Amelia Island. That last year he doubled the size of the church. Uh huh. Lord, you know, I'm like, well, I mean, this guy's weird. And I'm looking him up, and, and he's literally making all these boastful claims. And this is a classic example of a false prophet. But you know the one thing that he was that he was vague on salvation. You know the one thing that's missing off of his website salvation. And I asked him about that because it's clear on his website. He wants to come down with his family and his banjos and he wants to put on a shindig and a revival and have a big old altar call. And I'm thinking, man, we don't have an altar. Right. Altars aren't biblical, right? Yeah. And this guy's, and I looked up, I watched some of his preaching and it's even worse. Like he's this like emotional, trying to get a response out of you. And he'll, all right, raise your hand if you know God. All right, come on. And what about you that aren't saved? And it's like, well, wait a minute, those are two different things. Well, all y'all come on down or you know you're wrong with God. you got to let the Holy Spirit lead you. And all, all he's doing is building up emotionalism, trying to get altar calls in churches. Yeah. He's like a traveling salesman. He's like, a, he's like one of those snake oil salesmen, right? And the guy is not saved. This evangelist, Jeff Jones, is not saved. When I asked him, what do you have to do to go to heaven? It's not on your website. I don't hear it in your preaching. I don't see it anywhere in anything that I Google about your name. Tell me, what must I do to be saved? Oh, well, brother, it's real simple. Just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And be willing to turn from your sin. The Holy Spirit will draw you unto repentance. I believe that salvation and repentance are inseparable. And by that, I mean that the Holy Ghost will cause you to be willing to turn from your sin. Then you can be saved. That is a lie from the pit of hell. Yeah, that is a, a works-based salvation. Yeah. And then, you know what? And I told him, I said, you know what? This is Calvinism. Yeah. You're yeah. saying that God's just going to reach into my heart and make me sinlessly perfect. I will never want to sin again. That goes directly against what we just yeah, read. Right. That we should live unto righteousness. Right. It's my choice. I have to die daily. Yeah. I walk in the flesh like every other man. Yeah. And Amen. when I walk in the Spirit, I please God. Amen. But these, he wants to come down here and have some bit. We're going to have a meeting with God. We're going to have a tent revival. No, sir, we're not. He kept, when I told him, I said, what you're preaching is works, and you're preaching Calvinist, well, I, just, I can't help you, son. I said, I know you can't. You're not saved. The guy's wicked as hell. Yeah. And listen, we have to protect against this, this used car salesman, false doctrine, that people are going to come through and try to convince you that you become perfect or you have to try to be perfect to go to heaven. That is not what the Bible teaches. No, it's not. Salvation is faith alone, plus nothing, minus nothing, Amen. not plus Calvinism, not plus works. Jeff Jones. Guys, let him be a curse, the Bible says. Let him be a curse. Him and his banjos. <laughs> Look, 1 Peter 2.25 For ye were as sheep gone astray, but now are returned unto the shepherd and bishops of your souls. Hey, beware of the wolves, right? But look, we are as sheep. We, are, we as human beings, we think we're smarter than we are sometimes. 
right? But spiritually, the whole point of this is to grow spiritually, to walk as a new man. And instead of going astray, let's return to the shepherd and the bishop of our soul. God created your body. He created your soul. He owns it. If you're saved, he's, He should be in charge of your life. We ought to repent of our sins. We ought to try to live righteously. It's our choice. And that you cannot ignore or take away from, from what the Bible teaches. If you choose to ignore what the Bible says, that every day you must choose which direction you're going to go. If you ignore that, you will not be blessed of God. Instead, let's choose to return to the shepherd and bishop of our souls. That's good. Let's pray. Father God, thank You for Your Word. Lord, thank You for the book of 1 Peter. Lord, we love You. We love this church. and Lord, we're excited what You're doing here. We're excited for the true revival that we see every week. When we go out and knock on doors and we preach the Gospel to individuals, Lord, that is the only way to salvation. And we're thankful and humbled that You've given us this ministry. Lord, help us not to forget it. Lord, help us to choose to walk in Your ways. Lord, we love You and we thank You for everything You've given us. Thank You, Jesus. Amen. Amen.